it is so good to be able to come and listen and hear and respond to the Word of God because it changes us. It changes us from the inside out. Just as worship changes us from the inside out as we come into God's presence, it's so good just to be in God's presence and in His worship, not place where we're focusing on Him and who He is. And so today I'm, uh, I'm glad to be part of the series that you started here last week. Uh, Cameron started that. And I uh, just want to say thanks for that because I just feel that shift is really, it's a word for now. Yeah. It's a word for now. God is, is shifting us into the fullness of what he has for us. There's like a place that God wants to move us into that we haven't yet stepped into. There's a place that God is saying, I want to shift you out of some old things into some new things. I want to shift you into some new mindsets, into some new understanding of God's purpose and presence in your life because God is really, really looking for people willing to take the next step forward in the purpose that he has for you. And so as we talk about this, I believe that, you know, shift is something that happens to us ultimately. I believe uh, my, my title, which is actually right up there, thank you, is uh, Shifting from Worrier to Warrior. All right. And I don't know about you, but we've been in a season where it seems like we've been driven a lot by worry, by anxiety, by stress, by by the uncertainties of what's happening. What's going on around this? How's it going to play out? What's it going to look like in two years from now? You know, Margaret and I began an adventure. We sold our house and we bought a house and we thought we were moving from one house to the next house. But the next house was a townhouse. It was being built by a builder in Calgary. And it got delayed and then delayed again and delayed again. And so now what we thought was going to be like a simple step shift from one place to another God began to take us on a journey of adventure and trusting and believing and being dependent on Him. And so our house isn't built yet, but it's almost built. (laughs) Yeah, the the end of April now, they're saying. So we're we're excited about the possibilities of what God is building. Many times, many of you know that every time you see something begin to happen, you get a little bit of hope. And so when when they build the house and they're building it piece by piece and bit by bit, you kind of go, well, at least they're doing this. You know, they're, they're putting in plumbing right now. And you go, well, that's good. That's, that means that there's, there's, there's movement forward. We're, we're shifting from one state to another. And I was just thinking about this word shift because it is actually where we're at right now. And I, I don't know about you, but many of us are in that boat. Many of us are in the place where we're asking God, what is it that you've got on your mind for me, my family, my ministry, my purpose here on earth? What, what is it you're doing? that you want to release in me and through me. And I just want to say that every time we take the time to worship, every time we take the time to press into God, God hears our prayers. And he's always looking for the opportunities to meet us, to draw near to us, to to help us on the journey, to remind us that he's still God, and he's still on the throne, and he still has a plan, and he still has a purpose for our lives. He's coming alongside of us every single day, and we sometimes don't even know it but he's always present. Even in this season of waiting and wondering about where we're going to be and what God's doing, we just know that we know that we can trust him. Isn't that the ultimate? Trusting God when you don't know what's going to happen next. You see, God's goal is to reveal his presence to us in a way that will shift fear and shift it into faith. I think we've all been so overwhelmed by some of the things that we can't fix and we can't control that are overwhelming to us that we forget about this element of faith that gives us the purpose and the plan to go into God's presence and pray and believe and hope that there is change coming, that God can move mountains like we sung about today. He can do that because he's God. But we need to get our faith back and let the fear go. So God is challenging us today to take some steps, I believe, and I'm going to help you on that journey because I believe the scriptures really are very powerful in what they can give to us. And, And God has got all these great stories packed in the Bible that actually really help us. And I think I've been relating to this one in particular, which I'll, I'll bring up in a minute. But I just really feel like God wants us to move from this place of worry to the place of warfare. There's battles to be fought. There's families to be won. There's, there's, there's children that God wants to impact and release into the kingdom of God and the purpose of God. Lord, Lord wants to make this, this go from kingdom, kingdom one to kingdom two. Kingdom wants us to move from where we are to where he wants us to be. And there's so many things that we have to partake in and partner with in God. And so I'm, uh, this will be a bit of a challenging message, but I think it'll be fun. Just bear with me. See, the Bible says that we are all called to be warriors. We're actually, in Christ, we don't get to cruise. We don't get to just spectate. 
We don't get to just sit back and relax and put our feet up and let everything else just go the way that it will go without the purpose and the plan of God being unfolded. We get to play a part through prayer, through warfare. You know, there's no, when you look at the scripture, Ephesians 6, 10 and all onward, you find that great scripture, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. There's something about this mighty power that we haven't quite tapped into to the full degree that we should. I think that we taste it sometimes when we come into his presence and worship and we go, oh Lord, I can, I can, I can taste something. I can feel something. There's something unlocking. There's something being unlocked in my mind and my spirit. And then we go out into the world and we forget what we just experienced. And God says we have to keep nurturing the presence, nurturing that place of worship. And then as we go into this world, don't forget to put on that full armor of God and pick up those weapons too because they've been given to you for warfare. If you're not going to fight for your family, who will? If you're not going to fight for your neighbors, who will? If you're not going to fight for the goodness of God in this community, who will? We are the people of God called to be the light in the darkness and we need to pick, pick up what we've been given and say, God, I want to be that warrior. I don't want to live in this place of worry and wondering. I want to move into the place of being a warfare person, somebody who's involved in the war that you've got for me to fight, and every one of us does. There's battles that we all fight that we don't always fight in the same battles, but we fight our battles, and God says that he'll give us the strength to fight those battles. We're actually fully equipped to be warriors for Christ. See, the ultimate goal is that we put on our full armor and we pick up our weapons of God so that we can take our stand against the devil's schemes. He's always trying to push us back, push us down, get us consumed by anxiety, stress, and worry. But God says, I want you to rise up. Rise up in the power of the anointing and the power of the Spirit because God wants to shift something here today. He wants to shift our mindset, shift our understanding, shift our perspective. So what is this shift thing all about? Well, it's defined as an exchange from one position or state to another. To intentionally move from one perspective to another. Shift is actually part of our everyday life. Do you know that? Every single one of you have experienced shift to some degree or another in the natural realm of life. I was thinking just recently that God wants us to move in, in the, this whole idea of glory to glory. But I was thinking about how we need to see it as a practical everyday step. We're not just going to wake up tomorrow morning and suddenly go, whoa, I shifted. <laughs> it's a process. God works with every single one of us. He comes down into the trenches with you. He comes into that place where he wants to minister to you. He wants to heal you. He wants to restore you. He wants to give you a vision. He wants to give you a purpose. And he doesn't do it overnight. He does it step by step, day by day. I was thinking about learning how to drive. Actually, learning how to ride a bike. That was the first step. Many of you know that riding a bike didn't just happen naturally for most people. Somebody somewhere took the time to get you on a bike. My dad... I remember he got on, I got on the bike. I was terrified. I thought I was going to fall off. I was sure I was going to fall off. My dad says, it's okay, son. I got you. I'm here for you. We're going to do this together. I know it sounds a bit like God, doesn't it? And so, you know, there's my dad saying, come on, Richard, you can do this. And so I'm on this bike, and I remember being so tepid, so, so intimidated by this, this vehicle moving forward. And then suddenly I'm running, and I'm going a little faster, a little faster. My dad is getting out of breath, and he's, he's right there beside me, and he's going, it's okay, I got you, I got you. And then there comes a point when there's suddenly there's that shift, when you suddenly realize that there's this impetus, this push forward. And I realize I was riding my bike and I never look back. It doesn't mean I never fell off. It just means I never look back. So a shift happens to us naturally. God wants it to happen to us supernaturally. I had the same experience of driving a car. I was terrified of driving a car. Back in, in the old UK and Ireland, you, everything was stick shift, right? Oh, look, there's that word shift again. So we're driving this, this car, and I was terrified of this thing called the stick shift, this gear lever, because every time I tried to use it, my car would jump forward and lurch, and the next thing I know, it stall. And my, my dad was so patient, because actually he was a driving instructor, and he began to teach me how to control the shift, how to control the clutch. And I went from being a very, very, uh, I don't know, nervous driver to quite confident, almost too confident, to the point where... You know, I actually went on to become a driving instructor myself. But one of the nice things about my dad's car is he had dual controls. 
Jewel controls were a wonderful invention. Now, they weren't much good for stopping the car, but they were great for helping with the gear shift because it controlled the clutch. And he had a brake, so he could stop the car. He just couldn't make it go. So if somebody decided to stop in the middle of a road and not go anywhere, my dad was stuck. And so and I remember him just gently using that Jewel control to help me to make those shifts nicely. And over a period of time, I started to learn that, oh, that's how you do it. That's how it goes. That's how the shift happens. And I, I believe that our God is like that. He's like he comes alongside of us. He sees our weaknesses. He sees the places where we need help. And he starts to say to you and I, I know what you need. I know how to develop you. I know how to make you into the instrument of my glory that I've called you to be. I, I see all the giftings and abilities that you've got. I see everything that's in you, all that I have deposited, my spiritual gifts, my natural gifts. I have put them there, and they're for a reason and a purpose, and I want to help you develop them. And so he comes alongside of us like that jewel control, and he begins to help us develop into the people that we're called to be who are actually not afraid to shift from one thing to the next. Because every time you shift gears, you get a little bit more power, don't you? And so that's, you know, I guess that's where you get in trouble. Yeah. So this, this shift is important. As we become more confident in the instructor, in the coach, in the mentor, in the father, then the next thing we know, confidence starts to grow. Boldness starts to come. Because then you realize that, hey, I can do all things through Christ. It gives me strength. Whatever God's calling me to do, if he started it, he's going to be with me in it, and he's going to help me get to where I need to get to. Which brings me to my scripture text today, because I really do want to give you some, some meat of the word, because I believe God's word speaks into every single life. And one of my greatest heroes recently has been this character called Gideon. I would call Gideon a hero for the common man. Just you and me. We can all relate to Gideon. And I know I can't cover the whole story of Gideon today, and I don't intend to, so relax, okay? This, this will not be a three-hour sermon. This will be a snippet of the life of Gideon, but enough to get you thinking about what God does in each one of our lives to help us move forward. See, God is always looking for the opportune time. He's always looking for a moment in your life when you are ready to shift. You might not always understand what's happening in your life. You might just think to yourself, my life has become really complicated, or my life is really convoluted, or my life is really hard right now, or my life is really, I'm weary, I'm tired, I don't know what I'm going to do next. God says, that's okay, I'm here. I'm with you in this moment because I see it as an opportunity to shift you forward into the purpose and the plan I have for you. So don't dismay because you don't understand where you're at. Trust God that he's got a plan. And let's see where this goes today. So let's jump in on Judges chapter 6, verse 1. It's funny, the scripture starts off in verse 1 with the word again, which actually would indicate it's a common trend. It happens over and over and over again. A common trend. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, the Malachites, and the other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count the men and their camels, and they invaded the land to ravage it. So here we are, are in a very complicated moment in Israel's history. Seven years of oppression, seven years of difficulty, seven years of challenge, seven years of wondering how they were going to get through the season, seven years of actually being in a place where everything that they had was being robbed and taken from them. Everything that they had was being ravaged by this enemy who had encroached on their land. And evil had actually crept into the land because they had forgotten about who it was that started all this in the first place. See, the Bible is very clear all the way through. You can read about this. God doesn't stop or can't stop our enemies gaining ground when we willfully give it to them. If we give our land to the enemy, he will gladly take it. If you give up your prayers, the enemy will gladly invade that space. If you stop believing that your God is able, 
your enemy will continue to tell you that your God is not able. You will begin to believe the lie over and over and over again. And you will stop believing that your God can actually protect you and save you if you just focus your attention and worship on him and put him back in his rightful place and believe that he is the God who has a plan for you and your, your purpose is being unfolded even today. But I love this story. I don't like the part about seven years. Because we know better, right? Right? We know better. We would never wait seven years before we do this. But after seven years, this is what it says in verse 6, So Midianite, so Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. How many of you know that could have been a little bit sooner? It could have been like the day after. It could have been like, hey, something's going wrong here, guys. The enemy is encroaching on our land. What should we do about it? Let's have a prayer meeting. Let's, let's generate some worship. Let's get into the place where God is elevated above our circumstance. Let's begin to pray to the Lord. But you know what? God is so gracious and compassionate that after seven years, guess what? The Lord hadn't moved on. He was still listening, still responsive, because we know that our God is looking for the opportune moment to shift us forward in his purpose. And we can't get there without his presence. You see, there's no time like the present to cry out to God. Whatever you're going through, whatever challenge you're facing, whatever trial you're going through, whatever it looks like to you, just cry out to the Lord. God, you're, you're God. Help me in this time when I really need your presence. Number two is this. God's response to our genuine cry for help is actually instant. God wants to shift us forward. That's his goal. So every time we cry out to God, God hears and he responds. Now, he doesn't always respond the way you want, but he does respond because he has a plan to move you forward. So this is what it says in Jeremiah 29, 12. It says, you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. So wherever you've been, God is listening responding to the cry, the cry for help. Yes, Lord. But just that heads up, God's response may not be the one you want, but God's response is always good. See, Gideon is living in the promised land. Listen to this. He's living in the promised land. They've lived here now over 300 years. They've been in this place where all the goodness of God that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has been in this place, and they are living in that space when God said, I'm going to give you a land for yourself, and you're going to go in there, and it's going to be the land flowing with milk and honey. This was the promised land. How many of you know that when we're in Christ, we're in the promised land? But how many of you know that not all of us live in the promised land? Sometimes we forget who it is that we serve, who it is that is the Lord of this land. And so for the 300 years since Joshua died, they've actually neglected the relationship with God. They let it slide. And I love God's response because, like I said, it isn't always what you want. How many of you know that when I pray, I just expect God to fix everything? <laughs> Anybody else like that? Yeah. Anyway, God's response was twofold. Number one, which I didn't, you know, I looked at that and I went, oh, thanks, Lord. He sent a prophet. He sent a prophet. I was looking for the answer, looking for the breakthrough, looking for the deliverance, looking for the moment when God would shift everything forward, and God sends a prophet. Why did God send a prophet? Not the quick response I would like, not the, the fast fix I would like, but he had to point out to them how they got to that space. How did you get from where I had promised so much to you that you got to the place where you're now being completely ravaged by your enemies and everything that I promised to you has been taken on a daily basis. How did you get there? God wants to point out something to them that's incredibly important for you and I. And I think tonight, or today, as we just came into the Lord's presence and worship, I was just feeling that, that God, this is a breakthrough moment. This is a moment when you're saying to this church, there is power in the name of Jesus. There is, there is authority in the name of Jesus. There is an ability to move into the fullness of God through that gateway of worship. And I just want to say, you know, thanks, worship team, for leading us today and just helping us to have that moment of just breakthrough sense. You see, before God could shift their predicament, he would first have to shift their desire for his presence. Before he could shift their predicament, he would first have to shift their desire for his presence. This is what he says in 
in verse 10. I say to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live, but you have not listened to me. I wonder how often we cry out to the Lord for the fix, to fix our predicament, our circumstance, our crisis, but fail or refuse to seek his face and his presence first. See, ultimately his power flows from his presence. It's the flow through. Presence, power. We need the power. Let's not forsake the presence. So before things can improve, this is our first shift I think we need to make. We need to shift our focus and attention back to the Lord in worship and praise and adoration. Regardless of our circumstance, our situation, or what we're facing today, can I tell you something? It is like when you lift up the Lord above your circumstance, above your crisis, above your situation, God says, then I am hearing, I'm responding, I see where you're putting me, and I'm going to release my power into your situation because you've elevated my presence above your circumstance. His power flows from his presence. God wants us to return to fixing our gaze on Jesus, the author and perfecter of that faith. See, when he unleashes a great plan, uh, part B of that is, then he unleashes a great plan to shift all of Israel into their freedom and destiny. God sets out to find, I love this, God (laughs) sets out to find a mighty warrior to partner with to deliver Israel. You know, it's like, just the picture of that is just, it's not what I see when I read the Bible. I see, I see something completely different because God calls out the latent gift of a man who's not yet a mighty warrior, but he calls him out to be a mighty warrior. And I want to say to you all here today, even those I can't see, that God has called you out as a mighty warrior. He's called a latent gift of mighty warrior in you, out of you, but you might not feel it right now. So in this situation, we see God looking for, for, this, for this person who's going to deliver Israel. Many of you know that's a high call. I mean, this is a whole nation. God wants to deliver a whole nation, and he says, I'm, I'm going to do it, but I'm looking for a mighty warrior. And we would think, I would think personally that God would go looking for the Rambo or, or someone like really muscular and big and built. But he looks for someone who's completely the unlikely. It's not the way that I would have hoped it would have worked out if I was praying for a breakthrough here. You see, I would say, Lord, it's been a long, hard year, so why can't you just unleash your power to eliminate the problem? Just wipe out all our enemies. Get rid of them all. Destroy all that stuff. We've come back to worship. We're going to worship you on Sunday, so we're going to worship you. So you do everything else, Lord. But you see, God wanted to actually reestablish a people in a purpose. He said, I, I want you guys to come back to the house of worship. I want you guys to be a place where you know that you know that your God is enough. I want you to get back to the place where Jesus is elevated. I want you to know that whatever, face, whatever you're facing, whatever trial, whatever situation, that Jesus is enough. So here he is looking for a mighty warrior to lead the way. And I don't, I don't see all of this really the way that I would like to see it. But he picks the most unqualified least expected person for the job. And I think sometimes God does that with all of us. None of us really feel that we're fully qualified for the work God calls us to do, but yet he still calls us sons, calls us daughters, calls us his children, calls us his anointed ones, calls us kings and priests. He calls us to lift up and carry the anointing. He calls us to be a people who carry what he's given us into the places that we go, wherever we go. And he wants to establish a new a new shift in our lives. He wants us to be a people who are bold and courageous wherever we go. But I love this next part. This is the part I really want to dig into. The angel of the Lord came down and he sat under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abizurite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. And when the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Can I tell you something? At this point in time, Gideon is not a warfare, a war a warrior looking for a warfare to fight. 
He's a worrier whining in a wine press. <laughs> he's, he's fatigued. He's overwhelmed by the fact these, these people come in and they take everything they've got. They steal their land. They steal their, their crops. They take everything from them. But yet, he's in this place where he's protecting what he has because he sees that as his duty to, and responsibility for his home and his family. And that the Lord shows up in this moment to the weakest level that this man could probably get to hiding in a wine press because that's a, like a dugout in the ground where, where they get down there and they stomp on the grapes. At this point, there's not even any grapes around. It's just thrashing wheat for dinner or tea, afternoon sandwich. You see, God sets out to shift Gideon at his weakest point, worrying in a wine press, not a warrior. God's so gracious that he meets us at our weakest point. So whatever you feel today, you might not feel like a warrior. You might not feel like you have any real uh, purpose for this, this life that you're living today. And God says, but I'm here. I've come down to your level. I've come down to your place. I could have picked anybody else around, but I picked you, and I'm here for you today. And I want you to know that because I picked you, I'm going to work with you. It might not be a perfect science. It may not all happen as quickly as we would like. But God says, I'm going to work with you. I'm going to take as long as it takes because that's the picture we get in Gideon. He doesn't do it overnight. He doesn't do it in one moment. Gideon has so many doubts, so many fears, so many moments where he thinks, God, are you really with me? And God says, I'm with you. And he does something else. And then he goes, well, God, he's still there. How many of us are like that? You know, God does something great for you, and you, you get up one morning and you go, yes, God, thank you so much. You, you helped me get rid of that. You helped me pay for this. You helped me get through that. And then the next thing, the next day comes along, another bill comes along, and you go, oh, no, what am I going to do? <laughs> God, are you still there? That's the story of Gideon. Read it in Judges 6, and you'll see this story unfolding. I can't go into it all today, but it's a very powerful story about God's grace, how much he cares about moving you from where you are to where he wants to get to. To move you out of the wine press, out of that place where you're worried and overwhelmed by your life circumstance, to get you to the place where you're beginning to trust him again with new steps, new steps into the new thing that he has for you. He wants to shift you from where you are to where he wants you to get to. You see, the same God that's with Gideon. You know, what's very interesting about the story is the fact that we often say to ourselves, oh man, if God showed up in person, everything would be so much better. Everything would be so great. If Jesus showed up on Sunday morning at church, then wouldn't it just be so much better? Because then I'd know for sure that Jesus is real. Well, here's Gideon. The Lord shows up in person. And he's still doubting. He's still like proving that you are, are you really the Lord? I mean, you read the story, he, he actually cooks the guy a meal. It's like, he cooks the Lord a meal. It takes him forever. He has to go kill the, the goat. Then he has to cook the goat. Then he has to bring the goat out. Then he has to put it together. And then he has to put it on a stone. And the Lord just flashes his, his staff at it like the, what do you call it, a saber, light, lightning saber. That's gone. And then he believes it's the Lord. But then the next thing, he doesn't believe it's the Lord again. We're so fickle sometimes. And yet by faith, the Lord has said to you and I, never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. I'm here right now. I'm here with you today. I'm here for you today. I'm here for you tomorrow. I'm here for you this week. I'm here for your trial. I'm here for whatever you're going through. I am here for you because I am the Lord who never leaves you or forsakes you. And he always leads us, according to 2 Corinthians 2.14. Now thanks be to God who always causes us to triumph in Christ. But be encouraged by the fact that Gideon's shift forward took a while with many steps in between. It wasn't overnight. It took many, many steps. He still struggled with fear and unbelief all the way through. Gideon's greatest battle, actually, was letting go from his preoccupation over past disappointments. Now, I know that doesn't affect any of us. I've been doing ministry now for 32 years had lots and lots of disappointments. Many great things. God has done wonderful things. But there's been so many disappointments along the way. Many of you know that if we allow the disappointments to consume us, we'll miss the goodness of God in the moments that we're living today. God wants us to be thankful in every circumstance. Judges 6.13, this is Gideon's comeback to the Lord. He says, but sir, good to call the Lord sir, but sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, we've never said this, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? 
Where are all his wonders that our fathers told us about when they said, did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and put us into the hands of the Midian, Midianites. You see, Gideon's initial response to the Lord is to be a victim. He struggles to believe that God has come into this moment, in this time, to shift him from where he is to where he wants to get to. He's, he's, he's not believing that God is able to do what God is promising, and God has made some great promises to him. I think we're a bit like that. I think we lament about the things that haven't happened. You know, oh, if God is for me, then why did God allow? And we can all put in our own. Hopefully it's not a list. But we all have those moments when we think, if God was for me, then this would not have happened. If God was there, it wouldn't have happened. If God is for me, where are all the signs and wonders and miracles we read about in his word? Can I tell you something? This is something we need to understand here. That these signs and wonders and miracles that are in his word, they are for today. And they are gifts of God to you and I. And so that when we believe and we keep standing and keep believing and keep praying and keep believing, then the potential for those things to happen and break out in our midst is actually yes and amen in Christ. But we have to keep doing it. Keep asking, keep believing, keep coming to that place saying, Lord, you alone can be the answer to this problem. We need to get to that point where we're saying, I refuse to lie down and give up. I refuse not to be a warrior. I refuse to be stuck in this space. And then, of course, his, his confession was, if God is for me, why does it feel like I'm alone and abandoned? Why am I hiding in this wine press if God is for me? Well, it was actually his choice to hide in the wine press, but he didn't know any better. He didn't know any better. Can I tell you something? Sometimes we get ourselves into places where we don't actually know any better. But the worst thing is that when somebody comes along and tells you there's something better, you have to respond to that and say, okay, I have a responsibility now because somebody told me there's another way. <laughs> so when somebody says to you, you can't just live in that place of worry and anxiety and stress and there is actually a God who wants to bring hope into your situation, then you have to be willing to say, you know what, I'm going to take this, I'm going to believe this, I'm going to step into this because this sounds like a way better than what I'm living in right now. You see, this type of talk is actually the language of a worrier. It's the perspective that if God had done more, then my life would not be what it is today. Can I, can I just say something else? Because I will anyway. But, because I have a microphone. But the reality is this. Every life experience you go through, every challenge you faced, every trial that you have walked through, everything where you thought that God has let you down, can I tell you something? God can take that and use that for his glory. Because God needs testimonies. He needs people who are willing to walk through the valleys of life and say, my God has been faithful. Even though I went through a really hard and difficult time, my God has been good. My God has been faithful. He has come through for me. And I see his goodness every single day. And so God uses every single trial, every single crisis, every single thing that's hurt you and wounded you. God says, I will use that for good. Because there's people that need to hear your story. They need to know that God can shift their lives just like he shifted yours. I think an interesting shift happens in, in this situation because as he's lamenting to the angel of the Lord, as the, in this case, it's like there's suddenly this shift takes place in the scripture. Suddenly he's not talking to an angel of the Lord anymore. He's talking to the Lord himself because he addresses him then as the Lord. And the Lord is actually not really interested in all his reasons and excuses why he's trying to lament about all the things that haven't happened because, you see, God gets us to the point where he says, you know what, I don't want you to focus on all the things that didn't happen. I want you to get to the place where you're actually believing in faith today that God is the God of today and he's the God of tomorrow and he's the God that wants to unlock some things. He's the God of the present. We, t we tend to keep him sometimes in the past and God says, I want you to live in the moment Live in the present. Live in the now knowledge that God is with you and for you today. That's what God comes along and speaks to Gideon. Let these words of the Lord shift our perspective about ourselves today. This is what he says in, in Judges 6, 14. The Lord turned to him. The Lord turned to him. Capital L-O-R-D. Make sure you see that. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midianites' hands, out of Midian's hand, am I not sending you? That should be good enough for most of us. 
spot there. Let me read on. But Lord, but sir, Gideon asked, how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least of my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. I am with you now. I am with you today. I'm calling you a mighty warrior because I'm going with you. I'm for you. We're going to work this thing through. We're going to see the breakthroughs. We're going to see the next thing that God has for you. God has got you positioned exactly where he wants you to be. He wants to shift you as a church community. You're in the middle of a shift. God is saying, I'm shifting you forward. And God is saying, I want to shift you into the best things that are yet to come. And God says, you need to see that. You need to believe that. You need to walk in that. You need to expect that. He says, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites together. You see, the Lord is with us today. I'm just finishing up here. The Lord is with us today. He is with us today. He's been with us since you started out today. He's been with you since you got up this morning. If you're here, if you're online, wherever you are, the Lord is with us today. And we need to know that the Lord with us is enough. That whatever God has in mind for us, whatever the next step he wants you to take, whatever that shift is that's happening in your life, God has positioned you for this moment to take that next shift because God has good things in store. Many of you know that the Bible does say that God works all things together for good, for the good of those who are called according to his purpose and who love him. Back to worship. Love him. Put him back in his rightful place. And as we do that, God takes care of everything else. So God is with us. He's sending us with enough strength to be the warriors we're called to be. So God does not want you to live in a life of worry. He wants you to begin to trust him. Trust him that you too can be a warrior fighting in the warfare battles that he's put in front of you to fight because there's breakthroughs depending on you and your prayers. Breakthroughs depending on you doing what God's called you to do. And I love the Apostle Paul, just to finish up with one scripture, when basically Paul just was overwhelmed by all of the things that were on his shoulders, and he was just not even sure how he could do it. He's feeling quite weak in himself, and he had this thorn in the flesh coming against him. But he said this, he said, Lord, I just need your help. And, and God said to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 9, God said to me, this is God speaking, God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may work rest on me. See, the story of Gideon goes on. I don't have time to unpack it all, but I just want to encourage you. Look at the story of Gideon. See how he walks it out. See how he he tests God on a number of occasions, and God is so patient, so gracious. So don't think you have to get it all together today. This is not a, you know, smarten up and move on. This is a, this is a moment of saying, oh God, I def- definitely need your help today. Help me, Lord, to move forward in my life. Where I'm stuck, help me to shift. Let's just pray. I want to pray for you today. If you don't know Jesus today, I just want to say something. We all need that help. I don't know where I'd be today if I didn't have Jesus in my life. I've been serving the Lord for over 40 years now, and I can honestly say that he's made such a difference in my life. So I want to encourage you today, if you've never received Jesus, never accepted Jesus into your life, today's the day. Today's the day to leave worry, anxiety, and stress at the cross and say, Jesus, I need your help. I want to become someone who is able to fight the battles that you've got for me to fight. Not, not fighting against people, fighting against things that are against you, principalities and powers trying to drive you back, schemes of the enemy. So I'm going to pray, and uh, you know, by all means, if you feel like you want to receive Jesus today, I would just ask you to just put your hand up and say, I, I want to know this Jesus. I want to know this Jesus who can change my life and help me to win the battles that I'm facing. So Lord, I pray for everyone here today. I pray for every single person, Lord. I thank you, first of all, for that great grace. The Lord, you knew us before we were here. You had a purpose for us and a plan for us. And Lord, you want us to continue to grow and move from glory to glory. You don't want us to get stuck. You want us to keep moving forward, shifting into the next thing you have for us, that greater glory in our lives. And so Lord, I pray for every one of us here today to be strengthened where we're at, strengthened in our vision, strengthened in our purpose, strengthened in our understanding of who you are and how much you want to help us. 
And so I pray today, right now, that for anyone who's going through great discouragements, that, Lord, their faith would be stirred up. They'd be built up in the faith today. And they would know that they can call upon the name of Jesus and that he will help them today. And if anyone here doesn't know Jesus today, Lord, I do pray that they would just respond to you today, knowing that you are there for them. You want to help them just as you've helped me get through so many trials and so many disappointments over the years. You've been so good. And so, Lord, I pray today for anyone who doesn't know you, that, Lord, they would just see this moment as the moment to say yes to you. And, Lord, that they would just respond to you today by saying, Jesus, forgive me for all my sins. Lord, help me to let go of all my past disappointments. Help me not to worry and be anxious about life anymore, but to trust you. And I pray, Jesus, that you would make yourself very real to them as they say, Jesus, come into my life, come into my heart, make yourself at home, and show me the way. In Jesus' name, I pray.